Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another interview on Facebook with the National Spine Health Foundation. I'm your host today, Erica Anderson, and I'm excited today to be speaking with Dr. Todd Albert. He is the Surgeon in Chief Emeritus at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Albert. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Well, your bio is very long. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you are also a professor of orthopedic surgery at the Wheel Cornell Medical College um, and specialize in or orthopedic spine surgery and other disorders of the cervical spine, among many other things. Um, and we just thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, this month at the Spine Health Foundation, we are talking about spine anatomy and just sort of getting down to the nitty gritty about those kinds of things. So before we get started, I always like to ask um, our doctors and surgeons, how did you decide that you wanted to be a spine health professional? Um, it's an interesting question. And for I'm sure everybody has very interesting answers, but I like, I'm a person that liked very positive and I like everything. So I liked every single aspect of orthopedics and everything I was rotating in. I said, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, but what I loved about the spine was at, at the time I went into it 30 years ago and Stephen now, there's so much yet to be discovered that while we could help people, but defining what diseases we could help with surgery was quite unknown then, it's still moderately unknown. And um, there was just so much to discover that I said, this is a wide open thing. And it was really exciting to me. And looking back, you said 30 years ago. So, I mean, there's a lot I'm sure that has changed between then and now. What would you say are some of maybe a couple of things that you've seen change the most and been the most promising for spine health? Uh, probably two things. One, well, the way we control pain with surgery during and post-operatively has changed a lot. Um, our ability or we're zeroing in on some of the molecular basises of the diseases we treat, though we're not there yet to enable technology to treat them. And then the, the, the way we treat people surgically has become less and less and less invasive, not just in a marketing way, but in a real viable way uh, that's good mm -hmm. for the patient. The combination of less invasion during surgery and these techniques I alluded to of pain management during surgery allows patients' experience of surgery to be much better than it used to be. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard that a lot with the minimally invasive procedures and robotics and all of those things um, are very um, helpful and hopeful to so many people nowadays that, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, they didn't have quite the, uh, quite the path that they do today. Um, I wanted to ask, so spine health awareness, it's sort of something that people don't think about enough. You know, we talk here about how we hear about heart disease and we hear about, you know, lung disease and all of these things, but spine health seems to be sort of lacking in um, promotional uh, budget, I guess you would say. Um, why do you think it's so important for people to start raising awareness and really be more aware of this part of our bodies in our lives? Yeah, I mean, if people knew the numbers or the facts, they would make an effort to be so much more aware. You know, it's it's like the second leading cause of missed work days, spine, you know, spine pain, et cetera. That number one, it's just behind the common cold. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a huge portion. If you look at the Venn diagram or all the costs that large employers pay, for, for their health insurance and what the, they're at risk for. Um, the second or third largest number is musculoskeletal complaints and the by far largest number within that is spine problems. So it's a huge burden, it's a huge burden. And if people attended to preventative measures to keep their spine healthy and then early intervention to try and prevent things from going sideways, it would be, a huge life savings, but a huge cost savings as well. Yeah, just to the American healthcare system or worldwide healthcare system. Yes. Um, so when you think about, you know, because I think a lot of people, the first thing they think of is, oh, posture, you know, I need to sit up straight. But what are some of the other really simple, obvious things that people can be doing that maybe they're not doing enough? Yeah, you know, it's funny that you, you mentioned heart health. 
there's a huge overlap um, with people who are in good cardiovascular shape, a good aerobic shape, if they train to be in good shape, they have less incidence of back or neck pain. And when they have those incidents, they're less severe. This has been shown in some of the Scandinavian literature. So one thing people can do is just be healthy overall. Forget just spine health. Be healthy overall leads to less incidence and severity of, of spine pain. So cardiovascular fitness. Secondly, keeping people's core strong as it relates to low back pain, abdominal strength, the arching muscles, the muscles you use to make an arch in your back, keeping those strong. And again, the cardiovascular fitness, huge. If people smoke, they shouldn't smoke. And you know, obviously as a doctor, you say, oh, you shouldn't smoke. That's not even why, because it's been well shown that nicotine causes disc degeneration. So mm. putting first or secondhand smoke or tobacco products or nicotine products goes a long way toward at least prevention of deterioration of the disc. Those are just three simple things. In case you need another reason to stop smoking, you've got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when people think of the spine, you know, we all picture, you know, this long, you know, that we all have in our back. But when it comes to vertebrae, are they all created equal? Are they all the same? What is the worst part of the spine to injure? What can you say, say about that? It, well, it's interesting that they are all different and they have different um, needs and mechanisms of action, but I wouldn't say one's more important than the other, but some are, if you catastrophically injure your neck or, or severely injure your neck, you know, the neck and the thoracic spine, which is the part under your ribcage, that houses the spinal cord as opposed to the nerves that come off it. So Injuries can tend to be, uh, have, it, I would say that real estate's a little more expensive in a sense mm. because it can have really material effects on the way the whole body works. Likewise, but I should say, not likewise, but the low back, the vertebrae of the lumbar spine are the most commonly injured vertebrae or the most commonly diseased vertebrae, most frequently in need of treatment. And cause the most disability, that back pain we were talking about earlier, whether it's surgical or non-surgical, but they're the most frequent and the heaviest burden of disease. So while one might not be more important than the other, they are definitely different and have different outcomes of injury. Okay. Now, uh, we hear the phrase, get a spine or get a backbone. You hear that people say that all the time, but I don't think anyone ever thinks about what they're saying or what it actually means. But when you think about it, there's a lot of truth to it. And you know, when we think about it, we need our spines to be strong. So um, talk about how the spine is really the you know foundation of the entire body. Yeah, well, if you think about it, um, I'd said earlier, it houses some really, really important structures. And it, it is the, the highway to connect your brain to everything you wanna do, every fine motor of your hands, um, your gait, your function, your bowel, your bladder function, your intestinal function, everything we do is, while it may or may not be controlled through the spine, the highway that takes those signals to have you do it are through the spine. And so when it's dysfunctional, you're, you know, the human cannot be functional. Mm -hmm. It's exactly. really quite important. So when you're looking at, you know, patient care over the years, are we seeing things get worse in terms of the pop American population or even worldwide population or getting better or staying the same? Uh, it's kind of interesting. I think, honestly, I think they're getting better. There's more awareness of health and fitness and things like that over the years I've been watching. And um, I think there's actually more of a stigma, a little more of a stigma against things like smoking or mm -hmm. heavy alcohol use or things that can be detrimental to either your bone structure, or dish structure. Um, but I guess I'd have to say better, not better enough. We're all <laughs> more protective of people. You know, we see less catastrophic car accidents with drunk driving laws, airbags, things that are more safe. So overall, the trajectory is positive, um, I think. Okay, that's good. Now, do, does obesity contribute to, to spine health issues? It does only in that it's a surrogate for the lack of things we talked about that protect the spine. People who mm -hmm. are more obese 
are less in shape. They usually have less good body mass and are not, it's somewhat of a surrogate for not attending to those other things. It is also higher risk if they come to need an operation, there's a higher risk of blood clots, a slightly higher risk of infection, all those things that are negative, can lead to a negative outcome. So it's really important, I think, to stay, okay. again, stay as fit as possible. Well, we meet a lot of people who are very new to pain issues here at the foundation. And so we get a lot of people really nervous about surgery and they obviously a lot of people want to put that off till the very last, you know, resort. But for someone that's at that point and they're nervous and they've heard horror stories, what's, what's some encouragement or, or something you might let them know about surgery <clears throat> that may quell their fears? Well, what everybody should really know is that just because a person has surgeon after them, spine yeah. surgeon, and I like when you say spine health provider, because we're all spine health providers, and almost every surgeon I know or have ever met does not look at a patient that comes in with a disease and first things think, what's the surgery I'm going to do? You yeah. think The first thing you think is if you're treating a patient like they're a member of your family, which is the way we almost all of us look to a patient to treat them, is how can we avoid surgery? However, there are certain diagnoses where it's dangerous to not do surgery. It's more dangerous to not have surgery than have surgery. And there's certain things where you try everything and you can't avoid surgery. What I would say is with certain diagnoses, and now there's an increasing number of diagnoses in the spine, surgery is immensely successful. Yes, there are risks, but most risks are less than 5 or 3 or 2% compared to living with the disease they live with, which is incredibly debilitating. So I would say everybody should be fear, fearful of surgery. If they're not, they're not a normal human. But <laughs> they should know that surgery can be really effective. And when you have to bite the bullet, find a provider you're super comfortable with, know what the facts are, what the potential good and bad are, and dive in as a team. Are you still there? Yes. Okay, sorry. We froze up for a second. I'm like, just at the end, too. Um, well, I did you finish what you were saying before we froze? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I think you froze first. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I think <laughs> you froze first. I think you guys froze it, but I guess I froze. <laughs> Well, that was the last question anyways. So um, thank you so much for um, just giving us some of your wisdom and insight on this. I know a lot of people really appreciate it, and um, it means a lot to us to get it straight from the source. Um, so thank you so much, and thanks for watching, everybody. We will see you next time. Thank you.